because of how he practiced. And then having an interest in historic landscape always, went back to the University of Georgia because of Ian Firth, a professor there, who was just an amazing, amazing thinker about cultural landscapes, the whole way we would start to look at them. And while I was going back, I had the opportunity to apply for and receive a Neil Reed Research Fellowship to look at the work of the Olmsted firm in Georgia. No, Druid Hills is a neighborhood in Atlanta, for those of you who know um, the city, this great suburban suburb that, as I did the research and met people like Arlene Levy, who's in the um, audience, that this was the last great subdivision, um, more than a subdivision, really, a planned community by senior and then the firm would go on to do many more. But in that research, was really working at the residential work of the firm, blown away by the fact that the firm, starting with Senior and the Cotton States Exposition, came so many times to the South and wanted to come to the South. That Senior saw what he, from his travels through the South before the Civil War, that this, that, that we would have to be involved there, that we would have to, see the end of this enslavement and bring a new sort of civilization, as he would think of the word in a very positive sense, to a place that he saw lacking what he had grown up with in Connecticut. So bring you up to present. So um, I retired from the National Park Service for a couple of years, had come back on the board for the National Association for Olmsted Parks, and in 2016, with Arlene and many others, sitting in, at Fairstead with I don't think it was still Myra, I think, was superintendent then, but saying, if we don't start now, because that's the only thing I've learned from being with the Park Service, you've got to plan years in advance, because it comes so quickly, and we said, if we don't start now, there will be no Olmsted 200. And a, another gentleman whose name I'm not going to recall from um, Matt right there, oh gosh, you don't have to tell me early, but who would, who would also sort of realize that if we didn't start in 2016, there would be no Olmsted 200. So long story short, the board came together and said, yes, we're going to do this, and realized in 2016 that in the decades of NEOP's existence, we had never been to Hartford. We had never gone to the birthplace and the resting place of Frederick Law Olmsted to ask them, would they be on board for an Olmsted 200? Long story short, 2017, and that's my sort of advanced slides here. Um, oh, so let me just back up. So, um, we, Arlene and I talked to Jenny Schofield of the State of Connecticut and Chris Wiegren with the Preservation Connecticut and said, as we went along thinking about Olmsted 200, that every state that had this work should think of a project that they could accomplish by, by 2022 and part of this Olmsted 200 event that we were thinking might happen. So, um, long story short, Arlene and I worked very hard and Barbara Yeager too as, as a resident of Connecticut to get the state to think about the fact that they had never done any historic landscape work. And they were very interested. They actually wanted NEOP to do that work. And we sort of backed off and said, oh no, we're all volunteers. We can't take this on. We need to think about finding a firm who would do that for you. And long story short, I was invited by Liz Starch, an amazing historical landscape architect out of Charlottesville, Virginia, who went to Connecticut College 
and as an undergraduate worked with a botanist, a woman who just recently passed away, she was almost 100 years old, who saw the connection between land, vegetation and landscape. As an undergraduate, she was introduced to Olmsted and landscapes in Connecticut, went on to get a master's in landscape architecture from the University of Virginia. Kevin Klosterwell, who was also a Georgia graduate, was getting a PhD in Virginia in mapping, and Carolyn Braga from Nashville, who was a historic preservation professional, and we were all under the um, Red Bridge Group. Um, it's a firm uh, who puts teams together for different kinds of projects. So Alicia Luba, who was from Connecticut too, um, was our project manager, an amazing woman who's gone on to work for the National Park Foundation. So uh, we were selected for the job, and I was give you some background. So Connecticut ASLA, starting in 2013, Barbara, correct me about the update I got, had already started to look at this legacy they had in Connecticut, but they were the obvious projects. Seaside Park and Beardsley Park in Bridgeport, working your way up to Hartford and work there, but never really understanding the breadth of the work and the firm's work that really goes from, I mean, almost after we finished the Central Park, was called back to Hartford. And the last project is dated like 1978 when the firm is closing. So Connecticut, it's not the greatest number of projects, but actually has a breadth of projects that go from the very beginning under Olmsted's first years as a practicing landscape architect, that he sort of uses that term, with Calvert Vaux, all the way to the end of the firm in the 70s. So that's made it very interesting. And then as again I said, in 2017, NEOP is with Connecticut and saying, you know, are you in? They say yes. And then we discuss with them what a wonderful thing if Connecticut could look at its projects. And then they do put a, a call out a, a, and, and we were selected. And so I'll just say a caveat for this job was, this was the first historic landscape work the state had undertaken. We helped develop forms for the state of Connecticut so that what we did could be used again to inventory other types of landscapes. And I would say the only thing we probably really didn't get to were, I mean, I think they could be used for vernacular landscapes, but ethnographic landscapes. But, you know, this now, they have something in Connecticut to use in other ways. And that we ask them to put a cover sheet on that because there is a distinct connection among all these Olmsted projects, and, and Dean Yotary referred to it, is that they have unique job numbers. And that all these job numbers bring you into this rich archive of planning, of planning documents, photographs, letters. I mean, it's just amazing, the wealth of information. And I know I'm talking to people who argue about this, but whatever. And so, um, so, and then, and then the whole effort, which was a challenge. We had a year and a limited amount of money, and we weren't getting a dollar more than that money. But they wanted to know, how did Connecticut make Olmsted? How was Olmsted, because I think for most of us, think, I mean, you don't know him, think of, well, he was a New Yorker. He did Central Park, Prospect Park, you know, he designed, and he had a firm there in the 1870s. He was a New Yorker. Oh, no, no, he was in, he was in Massachusetts. I mean, he had a firm in Brookline, Massachusetts that lasts into the 1970s. He, they were all from Massachusetts. No. They were from Connecticut. The Olmsteads arrived in Connecticut with the founding. Okay. Yes. So, in, in 1636, a breakaway group from the original sort of Massachusetts Bay Colony, a Thomas Hooker, said, "You know, we don't like the way you're electing uh, the." And, I mean, it's all in elections, which is very interesting. We don't like the way you're electing the um, co congregational ministers. We're leaving. And so they walk to what is now Hartford, Connecticut. 1636, Thomas Hooker, and there were three homesteads in the group. And this map from 1636 shows land ownership by those homesteads in what became Hartford on the river. And so when Olmsted is born 200, almost 200 years later, his family had populated that state for almost two centuries. I mean, and again, I went to George Washington birthplace. It's amazing to me that George Washington was like the fourth generation of Washingtons at Pope Creek. These are not new people. These have been here. And it was a very a unique place to be born and to be living in 1822. And then, this is the famous Frederick Church painting of the founding of Hartford. And, I, and, it was, it, and, and one of our challenges was, 
You know, what was Connecticut like? What did Olmsted see? What was his landscape? And I would say, even though Church is painting a time he never saw, it's still the landscape of Connecticut. And it would be something like if it, what Olmsted would have known because that distant valley that he's, you see the light shining on, so it's looking east, the sun is rising over Connecticut. And that's the Connecticut River Valley, the widest part in the richest river valley in New England. So Hartford sits at the widest part of that Connecticut River Valley, the richest farmland that existed at the time. And then there were these uplands that bound this landscape. And you, well, we'll just, I mean, I, I'm, I don't take no, I don't write when I talk with notes. So it's tough to say, stop, 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 you've said enough. But there's no question that at Keeney Park, that this broad meadow is bounded by trees and you could enclose this landscape with worms. This was something that they knew the success of, of what it felt like to be in a place that's open. I mean, that, when they talk about our, you know, limbic brain and where we've been in the savannah, that is where we feel most comfortable, on the edge of, of a wooded, looking out at an open landscape. And Olmsted knew that from his first day. So here's the churches, this rocky upland, this broad plain water, and, and a beautiful place. And, and then the other thing, I was talking about Lee, one of the great discoveries, John Warner Barber. John, is that right? Uh, John Warner Barber, yes. <laughs> Pink did drawings and watercolors of every town in Connecticut and published it in 1836. So in Olmsted's childhood, someone has gone to every village in Connecticut. It's an amazing, you can buy the reprint for nothing. And here are these drawings of New Haven, um, this rocky Catwall Pass, where there were little bits of nature left. And one of the things we learned as we talked about the underlying topographic landscape of Connecticut, which I knew instinctively. I grew up along the Long Island Sound. I'm a different generation of Connecticut. My father came to work in New York. We lived on the Sound. We'll get to that. But in this day, everyone lived along. The, the money, the wealth, the trade was along the Connecticut River and this broad plain and these western uplands against New York that were, there was a smaller valley there that's still actually very much intact and there's some home sites we saw there from the 20th century. And then the eastern uplands that are steeper and narrower. But if you know that area at all, you come out of New York still today along the Sound and then turn and go up to that Connecticut Valley into Massachusetts. And so it's one of the reasons why Boston is really a different place. But, uh, but we'll, get, we'll get there. So here are these wonderful images, and I particularly love this one of a family, a mother and father and a little boy looking out across this landscape. So learning that in 1822, Connecticut is, is as deforested as it will ever be. Whether Olmsted ever really saw a native landscape, it might have happened in these upland areas where he saw remnants of trees and things. But all the large trees would have been cut that would have been of any value. So it would have been undergrowth, but even then was it not invaded by some exotics. So 200 years of farming, mining, grazing. I mean, the landscape was completely transformed. There was nothing that would suggest this bucolic. I mean, yes, they were all little farms and trees, but nothing that, and, and today, Connecticut's almost as forested as it was back in the um, pre, contact because of how we live today. Those farms are largely gone, and you drive the Taconic Parkway or up through central Connecticut. I think I get pictures. This is this is something that, I mean, it's something never that Olmsted saw, and then it's really where I grew up. I mean, it's a dense woodland. It's pretty amazing. So, I mean, Olmsted lived in a particular time and place. And uh, let me say one other thing. One of the things I found, the elm tree. So the elm tree is a distinct native tree associated with the Connecticut River Valley. It has a form, it has a place there, unlike many other places, I mean, probably along the river, but they knew that tree from the beginning. Every little village has elm-lined streets. So that Olmsted went on to use elms is directly from his youth, and he grew his own elm tree at one of his home yards. And here is Yale College. And, and you wouldn't know Yale College, I mean, the greens are still there, but the elm trees of New Haven were amazing. And um, so elm trees came right from his Connecticut youth and his wanderings in the Connecticut landscape. So, so the next thing you have to understand, what I'm trying to show here, 
I mean, Hartford is this amazing intellectual hub of thinkers and doers, and, and Olmsted's father was not educated in the, I mean, none of them were educated the way we think of today. I mean, if you went to college, if you went to Yale or Harvard or William & Mary, the first colleges in this country, you were studying Greek, Latin, Hebrew. You were, I mean, that was, you were, if you were preparing yourself for college, like his brother, you might have gone into medicine, but you were first, it was languages, it was nothing as we understand education, and we all know about Olmsted. He was not, the father tried but a series of ministers and schools, it didn't, it didn't click for him. That was not going to be his place of learning. But what he did do and what he did from the time he was six years old to the end of his life, he wandered, he talked, he read, he looked, he drew, and it's just this amazing education. And those of us who were challenged by all the education, you know, genius, is not limited by, and maybe sometimes inhibited by, what we would call education. And you're, you're getting oh, I'm, more, I'm sorry, I'm off talking. But but in this case, his his what would seem to have been a stumbling block, but he never really found the right teachers at youth. Although the father tried, he he did learn so much from his experiences. And and I know Arlene doesn't like the cartoon version, but I was thinking about it again. He was a happy child. People, his brother's friends commented on, nothing could bring him down. He saw a future, he worked to a, something that was not in place, and he could not be dissuaded. When he made up his mind that it was something he was going to do, as we all know from his careers before landscape architecture, he was, he, he was this optimist of, in an optimistic time. And I think that's the other thing we think about today is, you know, to be an optimist in a challenging time is, is hard, but he was an optimist in the most optimistic times, except we'll, you know, talk about a few things. So this is a picture of Reverend Bushnell. I mean, to learn that, I mean, Olmsted did talk about access to green space, of needing a park and all, but that was already in the thinking. And Reverend Bushnell may have drawn the first public park plan for Hartford. And then Olm said, that was their minister. Bush knows. was, <laughs> and he was, he was a famous reverend in the Congregational Church. He, when Olm said got to England, he saw his image in the house of one of the people he visited. So, I mean, Harford had, you know, a different, Dickens came to Harford and said, this is the most English-like village I've seen in the United States. This, I mean, wouldn't know that in Harford today until you get on the ground and walk it, but if you drive through Harford, as most of us has done, up to Springfield, you're like, whoa, how fast do I get past this? But if you get on the ground and walk the places that Olmsted still little glimpses, this was a beautiful village on the river. And so, again, and, and, and at Olmsted, this was all there. They had, a, they had the first museum, the Athenaeum. These, these thinkers came together, and on Olmsted's father was a, I mean, he, he was a wannabe. He, he was, he made, without education, made a lot of money with the dry goods business. I mean, he was the target of his days or whatever. I mean, a lot gets higher than that. But he made a lot of money for his time. He was, a, he wanted his children educated. And I mean, he sends John off to learn French, so he's prepared to go to Yale. I mean, it's amazing. And that he would, he had been part of subscriptions for the Athenaeum, for the, um, what became the Hartford Insane Asylum. And your volunteer was there earlier, who was in Maryland, who's studying this. I mean, it still exists today as a mental health institute that Olmsted goes back to work on. So that, um, that, and so by the time we all know the story that Olmsted is ready to go to Yale, which he certainly would have done, he would have been prepared enough. I mean, he's a great reader and writer. He's unlike many of us as landscape architects who go into it because we're not good readers, we're not good writers. But he actually was, from all the reading, he loved that sort of thing. But then doesn't get to Yale because of this eye infection, but follows his beloved brother to New Haven and is there at the beginnings of the Sheffield Scientific School. I, I, I grew up, our favorite trip was up to New Haven to see the Beinecke Rare Book Library, but never understanding really what Yale was all about. Yale College is so distinct, and this scientific school is the first of its kind that these are men who realize, you know, that Hebrew. Um, 
create lab good, but we have real problems to solve here. And in Connecticut, it was about agriculture. I mean, the, the scientific school is all about uh, scientific farming, agriculture, and there he meets Benjamin Silliman, Pipkin, or whatever, and they are traveling to Europe to study practices there. So when Olmsted goes to Europe and walks and talks to the American farmer, he had a friend, a, a professor, a young professor at Yale, who he loved, who was already been to Germany. And so the idea that he would follow John off to England because he definitely wanted to go, of course he did. But he knew that that was something in the thinking of the time, that, that, that this scientific school was relying on looking, seeing, doing. That you just, you, you know, and I, so I never talk about Holmes anymore as an experimental farmer. He was a scientific farmer. He really meant, whatever he decided to do, he meant to do it the best way he could with the best knowledge. He goes out to study with the farmer in New York. I saw the sign, the Geddes Farm, which is just north of where Cornell is. He went that far because he heard that Geddes was the farmer doing the best work and spends, and Geddes desperate for him to stay because he's such a hard worker. But he goes back, buys a farm at Satchel Head and in Connecticut and then gets started on his own. So, again, again. But, but the other thing we're asked to look at is this breadth of work. So not only do we have Frederick Olmsted, but we have John Charles Olmsted, the last of that family educated at Yale. So John Charles Olmsted follows his father's, John Olmsted, so we all know the story of Olmsted marrying his brother's wife after his brother sadly dies of tuberculosis. And John Charles goes off to Yale and studies at the Sheffield Scientific School and then works with amazing people and goes across the United States. I mean, these are amazing travel people at working with the, um, not long ago, but right, like, but, but, who John works with as he goes across the U.S. The, the, I mean, the survey, the survey, the survey yeah. Yeah. So, so, I mean, as I said, before the Civil War, you know, just as they're finishing from Central Park, of course, Fred is called back to Hartford for this Institute of Living, and so this is one of the first projects he works on. But what I think we realize is, you know, you go where the money is. And it would seem from the very beginning, lots of work in Hartford that Olmsted might have done, but the money is in New York. He come back after the Civil War, he and Vox start a firm, the money is New York. And so the big projects are going to be Prospect Park, Riverside, Buffalo. And when he gets caught, when those projects in Connecticut, he's certainly interested and he meets people, Jacob Wiedemann being one of them, who he says, you know, in my place, and that goes right on to the end, you know, there are other people who I believe can do what you need done. And so Olmsted is certainly involved with the Institute of Living, but this is Wiedemann's um, drawing of it uh, in his book, and he consults there too. And, um, but just, you know, amazing work. And, and so the other thing, I mean, so this image, you know, sort of talking about what, you know, so from the state we had gotten that they already had these historic contexts that are the, Western uplands, the Central Valley, which New Haven is part of the Central Valley, even though the Connecticut River makes a big turn in um, Middletown and comes out at Old Lyme, the Eastern uplands and then the East and West coastal zone separated at New Haven. So where the river, the big delta there, but that's you know different rivers that come out there, and then how the landscape work kind of follows that. And, and then he, here you see, we were looking at, you know, where were the concentrations of work? And I think this is, um, you know, all the projects in Connecticut. But see, and, and I, Ar Arlene once told me, they're pomegranates. You get these clusters of work in certain places. And so certainly Hartford being one cluster, New Haven being a cluster, metropolitan, you know, all the commuting commuters out of New York along the eastern, uh, western, coastal slope, and then Litchfield and other, uh, Torrington, um, different clusters of work, but they're not all over their state. They tend to be in certain places because of the people and industries that are there. And then we you know, looked at all the places that Olmsted went to school and are significant to Olmsted's youth, so this map on the left, and how that to some degree tracks where projects are in the state as well. And then, it was very interesting to see that the master list of Olmsted projects really talks about 12 landscape types, starting with parks and parkways and recreation areas, all the way down to for miscellaneous, well, arboretum, garden, and miscellaneous. Of those, I think, 12 types, 
10 exist in Connecticut. They never got a exhibition and fair by that firm. And I think that's, and, and Arboretum Gardens, it's questionable there was a plan for a botanical garden that never was realized, but that they worked in all landscape types during the firm's um, existence. And then, you know, just about the resources. I mean, it, it, we could not have done this without all the decades of work that National Association of Homestead Parks with the National Park Service and others have done to put together um, the master list of drawings that, and plans that exist, the correspondence which was reflected in Orgo first, the on, uh, online research guide to Olmsted that is coming together in Olmsted Online. It's an amazing resource that's now linking directly to the drawings being scanned by Fairstead and the Library of Congress resources that are being scanned. There's never been a better time to do Olmsted research. It's just amazing what you can find and do. But not to say that in doing this project, and so this is us out on the field, and, you know, and documenting these contemporary in addition, you know, what is, they wanted to know how many of the 298 project numbers for Connecticut were realized and exist. So out of the 298, we surveyed 142, but that was calling out many that seemed not to be there. And, um, and, and like one job number was just Junior's nose. He was giving a um, lecture at Yale Art School. So I mean, there were, those, there were just things that weren't really jobs in the sense that we think of jobs, but that's part of the process. I mean, if, when you take on any of this work, and especially looking at it statewide, what do all those job numbers represent? And then within job numbers, there are other jobs, and we'll talk about that too. So we also showed them that you could use these scanned Olmsted images and overlay them on Google photography and align those pretty successfully to know without ever really going out to the site how much might be there because that was another way of culling our survey efforts. Where did we really need to go? What was left? And here's an example of um, Goodwin Park in Hartford. Amazingly intact and the big, one of the big changes being an overlay of a golf course. So I mean that, so that came out of that. But I was saying, in addition to all the records that are available in these various national archives are the local work. And, and a great area of research that I, I'm looking at young people in the audience that you might take on if this is your area of interest, is to understand all these park commissions that really must have stemmed. I talked to Ethan Carr, a great Olmsted historian who's at um, University of Massachusetts, Amherst, about, you know, that probably started with Central Park, these park commissions, and that, and that commission preceded Central Park. I mean, they are a selector of the winning design. But all the cities in Connecticut that had any work by the Olmsted firm already had a park commission in place. And these are the movers and shakers in their community, and they are doing serious work. And the reports published in Hartford, and I we didn't see them in New Haven, I'm assuming in New Haven would be much the same in Bridgeport, they were amazing. And I was thinking, how many cities of these sizes today have these serious, committed people to documenting every year the changes to the park, the budgets, needs, and, and it's just amazing. And, and, and why, why there was this interest in all of these people coming together to make sure that parks were created and sustained with real with real money and real interest and then um and then just the various resources i mean we know there are wonderful historic images and plans that you can go out and take into the field and and confirm what was done and what was there and i'll just you know we talked about you know d did a great job of where are these concentrations in states but clearly hartford over the firm's life has wonderful resources associated with the Olmsted firm and everything from you know a college this you know the retreat for the insane um, many parks and that was the other thing that what seems today had to have been individual park efforts they were designing systems and, I, uh, and you know we talk about Buffalo Olmsted Park and Boulevard system but it was so interesting to see that both Hartford, New Haven, and even Coral Bridgeport that I grew up next to was originally conceived as a park system. And I think that's one of the other things that we know and cherish about Senior and the firm. They never did what they were asked. They were always looking for the bigger project that would serve to solve the problem. And I, I, I was thinking that yesterday when we were listening to that wonderful woman in the morning, Ayanna Johnson, 
and she talked about those that Venn diagram of things. I thought for Olmsted it was people, place, and problems. It wasn't really about, I mean, design was the way you got to a problem. We certainly, and all the firm wanted the results of their problem solving to be beautiful, and, but it first had to function. It first had to resolve the issues at hand. And why today, we talk about green infrastructure, because these are, these are problem solving landscapes. They are, and, and one of the biggest problems we have are places to go out and exercise and walk and be healthy, but they weren't designed, they weren't just aesthetic exercises. He was not out there just, you know, and I think too often we think of our landscape projects as aesthetic efforts. That was not what that firm was doing. They were solving the real problems of their day, which were diseases they did not understand and knew that only getting out to fresh air and having a healthy environment seemed to be the best thing you could do for people so that they weren't sick. They were solving immigration problems, that people would arrive in these cities with no place to live, no place to go, no place to shower, no place to get fresh milk. I mean, the dairy at um, Central Park is a beautiful little vernacular or whatever it is, but it was first a dairy so that people got something they could not get in the, you know, in the tenement row on fourth, you know, Avenue, making that up. But I mean, these were these were ways of addressing the real problems of their day, and they will be the way we address the real problems of our day too. And then these are just images, you know, Hartford, the capital that sits above um, Bushnell Park, now named for Bushnell, who drew the first plan. Um, and one of the things, you know, the river used to run through the park and is now underground. But I mean, they're wonderful projects that could be taken on in Harvard, uh, Har Harvard, Hartford, to um, re re recall um, more of the Olmsted landscapes there. And then, I mean, it just goes on. There's more work there that, you know, just all through the period. And the, the Keeney Bell Tower, Keeney Park, the Keeney family gives money and land to build Keeney Park, but they also set aside a tower and memorial of their, their a, a grocery store owner in Hartford, um, and this is a park, and, you know. Um, but again, I, I, and, and these are contemporary parks, in 1958 to 1960, Wickham Park, but they all had something of, of Olmsted Senior's aesthetic there. Bridgeport, again, oh gosh, Bridgeport. Um, but Seaside Park, I think one of the great efforts, Olmsted and Vox in Bridgeport, but for those of you who wouldn't know, this is the home of P.T. Barnum. P.T. Barnum built his fourth house facing, uh, and, and, I, and then the image of P.T. Barnum and Frederick Olmsted out on this landscape talking about a park, no question happened. I, I, I'll argue with anyone. I mean, P.T. Barnum had been mayor of Bridgeport. He is a planner. He had done other areas. He knew exactly what he was doing in picking this place. Olmsted and Vox come out to do it. I, I, there is a, there's something there, but two such different characters from the same state, but doing, you know, engaging people around, you know, how do you entertain people? And there was an entertainment value in parks, but, you know, Olmsted and P.T. Barnum, I mean, just an amazing story to me. And then Beardsley Park is probably the most Olmsted-like of the parks there in Bridgeport. But the, as I was saying, there, there was a system plan, so there's two, there's two major donations to extend Beardsley Park with the Fairchild Memorial Land, and then um, Beachwood Park, the JCO said, this is never gonna be a great park, this is terrible soil, the trees don't look so good. But it was land given for a park, the city, because of the indu industrial growth of Bridgeport, it was kind of topsy, they never became parks, but they are sites of Bridgeport High School, and we could document lots of land left that, and where these places could be connected. And, and, the, and the Fairchild Memorial Park is the magnet school for Bridgeport and Trumbull, but the trees, in areas of that land that have never been developed are amazing places that are there and, and recognized by um, John Charles Olmsted to be some of the finest trees and landscapes he'd seen. Um, Torrington we're talking about another, you know, so the next wave after this sort of post-colonial period of Hartford that's sort of, or Connecticut, you know, in, in the, you know, before the Industrial Revolution really takes off, but as, as, it, as the Industrial Revolution takes off, I mean, Connecticut is the, 
as a hub of industry um, along the rivers, Collinsville, where Olmsted was trained to survey, um, Bridgeport, Torrington, the Midgen family, manufacturing company. But like so many families of the day, they didn't just do, they thought of where they were bringing people to work, the places they live, the places they would rest finally in the cemetery are bringing the Olmsted firm into design for that community, an amazing um, collection of projects. And here are just some of the um, remnants of, and, and I don't know if Peter Vitoretto is sitting here, but they're working on Hillside Cemetery in Torrington and doing a rehabilitation of that cemetery. And again, New Haven, I mean, I'm not quite over time, I know, but New Haven, you gotta go. I mean, New Haven is so amazing. And to think of the Olmsteads there and Yale College, which looks nothing like this now, but um, because they moved, what, what the college had been set back in this park-like setting, they moved to the street to, to bring the students in so they'd have no interface with what New Haven was becoming in an industrial age. But one of the great discoveries is a contemporary of Olmsteads who finished it New Haven called Donald Grant Mitchell. He calls himself a landscape architect. He is basically the same age as senior, but neither reference each other ever. I have fine, and I, I, this is a interesting research project. Who they're also celebrating his 200th anniversary this year, and he's responsible for some of the early park work in New Haven at um, East Rock Park and Edgewood Park that the Olmsteads come back and do. The, 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 firm does with Junior um, for the, the New Haven plan. And, oh, and this, for all of you football fans in the I believe this is the first professionally laid out athletic grounds in the United States. Olmsted is called to Yale because he, they cannot stop the students from playing baseball and football. And they're hurting themselves, out, and they cannot stop them. It's after the Civil War, and all schools are struggling. And the first baseball, I mean, Yale is the athletic college of its day. It had a rowing crew like nobody else's, except, you know, Harvard, their big time. But baseball, they had lost him. They call Olmsted out. And these athletic grounds that he designs in the 1880 is where Bushfield is today, that is still the grounds of their baseball stadium. And come forward to camp, um, is it Donald Camp or someone, who knows, but the camp gates, which I thought were their World War I memorial, because I've never seen such a triumphal gate ball. I walk up to, it is camp being celebrated for making college sports what they are today. And the Yale Bowl is behind that. And all bowls are named for the Yale Bowl. That's a National Historic Landmark. And the camp gate has panels of every college team in the United States having given money for this effort. The University of Georgia's up there, the University of Alabama, the Southeast Conference, all those schools have given money because camp is responsible, at least by the 50s, for where college sports is going. And think of the billion, billion dollar industry it is today. I think starts right here by Olmsted, senior. So okay, that's what we have to research. I think that's a great one. Um, and then even more important, that right after, I mean, that, that, that they're working on these projects all at the same time. So Junior is allowed, well not allowed, but is asked to come to be part of the Macmillan Commission in Washington to do the plan because the father has died, I guess, by that point when he sits on the Macmillan, or on his way out. He's certainly at McLean. But he comes, and I think one of the first times he does not refer to himself as Junior. But because of having been part of Junior, part of the Columbian Exposition, as you know, he's being tutored by the father there at Biltmore, and you know, he's asked to be part of the Macmillan Commission. And as he's finishing that, the thinkers in New Haven call him and Cass Gilbert. They would they would rather have had um, Macmillan, uh, you know, not Macmillan, but. Um, the firm, but anyway, but Cass Gilbert, who has a summer house in Connecticut, so I think they might have something to do it, to come to do a plan for New Haven. And it was so interesting to read. It's reprinted with um, a foreword by the great art historian, and they barely talk about what the Olmsted firm did. It's all about Cass Gilbert and the unrealized boulevard and plan from the railroad station. I'm like, are you kidding me? The Olmsted firm I know wrote that report. And it is the most interesting sociological study of New Haven, its neighborhoods, its needs, a double ring of parks planned, propo proposed for New Haven. And of those rings, this double ring, an internal ring, and a secondary ring, an amazing amount of work. Five mm -hmm. parks come out of that. They come back at, in the 20s and do work in all of those parks. And it was just fascinating. And there seems to be almost no knowledge of that history in New Haven. I mean, here is this 
I wish I were there because there, there, there's so many. But East Rock Park, I mean, this this is New Haven, which I didn't know until I went back, shared a capital with Hartford well into the 19th century. That New Haven was founded the next year by another breakaway group who, instead of walking to Connecticut, took the water route and came into the harbor at this natural harbor at New Haven and founded a second colony in what is now Connecticut. And for years, when it became after the American Revolution, they shared capitals and it went back and forth between New Haven and Hartford until Hartford started to build that capital building and it was kind of like you win and, and so New Haven became the sort of intellectual center because of Yale College and all it became but but um, Davenport the the hooker to New Haven so he's the reverend who founds New Haven has a vision from the East Rock of a what was a well-known nine square grid in Europe of a sort of the celestial city and that's what Connecticut is New Haven is laid out on but all of these parks that could see this is the West Rock in every case the Olmsted set up this amazing view of the East and West Rock and at um, East Shore Park this abandoned boulevard down this industrial you can see the East Rock, and it, it is square on the monument at the East Rock. And so not only did they plan a park, they've been there to see what is the view you would want from this place, not just the water's edge, which this, this is all along the New Haven Harbor. It's this amazing going down to the Nathan Hale Park that they laid out. But they knew that the reference point for this place is the East Rock and the memorial on top of it. So it, it, it's just really amazing work to do. And then this, let me just point out, this canal, so West River Park, Memorial Park, that was to have been a natural park, they were getting started right after World War I. And it was decided to be New Haven's World War I Memorial. And they were laying out a formal waterway at the end of which would be a memorial, much like Washington, D.C. I mean, this is, think of this as the, a water mall going down to a memorial. And they got as far as dredging this very re long rectangular canal, and then the project really gets abandoned. I'm not sure exactly we didn't get into that kind of detail, but that certainly six behind all this Phragmites, and this is, this is the parking lot off the Post Road, which if you know Connecticut and New England and all, this is the major route. New Haven has left it like this. There were a lot of sad sort of homeless people, but, and the other end has been chopped up, and this side is L.O.T. Grasso Boulevard, but it is this amazing park space. And along this western edge is Marginal Drive, which was laid out by the Olmsted firm, this amazing drive up that terminates at the athletic fields that are owned by Yale. So not only, I mean, they had this incredible concept there of how these different green spaces would tie together around New Haven. And then, in addition to these, are these important outliers. So Walnut Hill Park in New Britain, and, and then I'll just say one thing, I'll stop here, I, I know you're tired. Uh, Kakamon, so here is this amazing subdivision that Arlene and I had talked about in Greenwich, Connecticut. So this, this sort of last period of Connecticut that we probably know best today from Mad Men and all those places, that's certainly how I got to Connecticut. All the executives and business owners who, who are in New York um, who look for places outside the city to live. And um, not understanding that history really at all. But I would say for Connecticut, it dates to Isaac Newton, Newton Phelps Stokes. So Cackham Wood was first, and the job number is for an estate that he builds in, New, in Greenwich for he and his wife, Edith Minter. He, if, if any of you know John Singer Sargent and the great portraits that he did, it hangs in the American wing at the Metropolitan Museum in New York. John, John Singer Sargent paid Edith Minter in her black like a mutton sleeve jacket, she has a white tennis skirt on, a boater. Isaac Newfelt is standing behind her. That is their wedding portrait. Edith Minturn was the model for the Columbian statue at the Columbian Exposition in Chicago. The Minturns, her father is probably the writer of the letter in the newspaper that said, we need a Central Park in New York. Uh, Stokes said, Vox told, taught him to boat on the lake in Central Park. I mean, and Stokes, I mean, it's just an amazing story. He builds his estate here because the family's money used to bring them further up the Hudson, but he and Edith are so involved in their work in New York, they can't be that far away. They are the first commuters into New York because they are these busy, busy executives. They pick 
Greenwich because it's the rail line that comes out to Greenwich and beyond. And they built the high-low, his house, he became an architect, story you'll could go on all reporting on, but built his house. But by the early 20s, he's already seeing, this is too much for me. They're spending their money quite quickly. And um, he subdivides that into Cack of Wood, the subdivision, which is the project that everyone knows now. And the house that he built, this amazing Tudor revival, that he actually moves an actual Tudor house from England to add on to it, made the national news. I mean, the national news that he moved that building brick by brick and had it reassembled his house at, um, at Cack of Wood, were torn down in the, like, 50 because the owners didn't move old and they didn't want it. But the subdivision is there, this amazing subdivision of homes. But the one of the most interesting houses there, which we saw from the street and we get access to because of, of, of who these people are and who they, um, but was the co cover of Country Life magazine. So, and, not, and I'm forgetting the date right now, but Country Life magazine was actually started by the great um, botanist at uh, Cornell, whose name is right out of my head, but it was really originally thought of as a magazine for country people about living better in the country, but it quickly became a, one of the first sort of home magazines for people in New York who dreamed of the country. And so its images of Tudor revival houses and subdivisions in Greenwich were New York City people's idea of moving to the country. And so you see this steady progress of subdivisions, many done by the Olmsted firm, of people coming out of New York to live in the country in a house that was built you know, as a second wave of wealthy homes in Connecticut. It's just amazing, I mean, just amazing. So anyway, I'll stop there if you have any questions. It's an amazing project. I have a copy of the report. It's going to be an online, they're, they're gonna put it online. They're not printing copies of it. But, um, and also the survey forms at some point will be available if you had an interest in any of these places. But I would just say for all of you who live anywhere near an Olmsted landscape, as he was saying, I mean, there are these amazing places of stories and people. And we, one of the things I think I, I feel really close to, we did little bios of all the people that report to the Olmsteads, both, you know, and, and Connecticut, who they intersect with, and people who worked in Connecticut later as the profession starts to grow. Who are the other landscape architects working in Connecticut? And I'll just say, that was an interesting part of the project. And I'll just say one last thing. That we're all here today because of Olmsted. Because he said he was a part of a time and a place and a people who said you must get involved together, you must come together, you must spend time together and share your knowledge and do the best you can with what you learn there. And there's no question that NAOP, ASLA, the American Institute of Planning, the Planning these things, were directly a result of someone like Olmsted's commitment to the work that he was doing and the people he was serving. And that comes right from this Connecticut ethos of humility. I'm not here for me. I'm here for you. I am here to do whatever. I am here to solve your problem. I am here to do what you want done. And I'm going to show you what I know and do it as well for you as I can do. And I, and, and who was I talking to? Um, you know, the hours, months, years of volunteer work they did. I mean, Junior is out of his life, he's giving away, he's never charging, he is serving the National Park Service. I can't imagine how many hours you were saying no, that he gave away because he, they so believed in what they were doing. And as I said to young professionals coming to their office in Fairstead, don't come here because you're gonna earn anything. You're coming because you have this commitment to the work being done. I'm not saying that's a good thing. And we all talked about work-life balance. And, 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 and people who have come to the profession without that tradition are gonna change this profession but it is the roots of our profession. And it's one to be explored because, it, I mean, you can't do it all. You, you, you gotta give something up sometime for free. So I'll just leave you with that. So thank you for coming and um, I hope, yes. Thank you.